friend, welcome to Romans chapter 8. You have made it halfway through Romans. Way to go. And I'm telling you, this is a delightful place to be. Romans chapter 8. This is going to be a glorious week. Let's just dig right in by reading today's passage. Here we go. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh, it's death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. The word of the Lord. Amen. All right, friends. Well, <laughs> I think we could just probably call it a day if we simply read verse 1 of today's passage. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I put that down as the main point of today's passage. And once again, I noticed that word, therefore, this transition word that has brought us into Romans chapter 8. And just thinking about, okay, where did we leave off in Romans chapter 7? And um, if you remember, we ended by saying, oh, wow, we all have a sin problem. It doesn't matter if we are Jewish or Gentile. Uh, th that's who Paul was talking to when he wrote this letter to the Romans. This, this um, church of believers in Jesus Christ made up of a combination of Jews and Gentiles. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who we are. We all have a sin problem. And it is the law that made that abundantly clear that we all have this sin problem. Paul ended last week by saying, but thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. He recognized, he, he cried out, wretched man that I am. And we all need to come to this point where we recognize just how poor we are and who can rescue us. There's nothing we can do to rescue ourselves from this sin problem. But he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. It is Jesus. It is God through Jesus who rescued us from our sin problem, such that now Paul can say, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Friend, can you grab hold of that? Can we grab hold of that? That there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Yes, we have this battle of war that wages within this flesh that we live in, <laughs> but God sees us through Jesus Christ and he has given us the gift of his spirit.
Ah, Paul unpacks this in Romans chapter 8. And in this, even, you know, in this first, I'm going to say quarter of Romans chapter 8, Paul unpacks the work of God. It is God who does this rescuing work, right? There was nothing that Paul could do to save himself. There's nothing we can do to rescue ourselves from this sin problem. But God, but God through Jesus Christ has done it, has done it. And we only need to have faith in him to uh, receive this grace, uh, this gracious gift, this merciful gift that God has blessed us with. So Paul unpacks the work of God through Jesus in this passage. We see God, we see Jesus, we see the Spirit being the centerpiece of today's passage. I counted 21 times uh, God is mentioned, whether uh, God the Father, God the, uh, God the Son, God the Spirit. Uh, he takes center stage in today's passage. All right. I think it's important, and maybe you're like, okay, Carmen, let's move on from verse 1, but let's understand uh, these words, no condemnation. I really, maybe it's just me, but I find it hard to just receive this. Like, I know this battle that wars, uh, this battle of the flesh that wars within me. I know I am a sinner. I know that I am guilty. I know that I deserve God's um, God's condemnation. So let, let's just understand what condemnation is. This is his divine du- judgment and the consequences of sin, right? This is what we are due, the consequences of sin. It's a state of being found guilty and deserving of punishment due to the violation of God's moral standard, due to the violation of his laws, of his ways. And uh, Paul says, look, there is none of that. There is none of that. You can let that go. You can let that go. Um, All right. How can this be? Friends, no condemnation. How can this be? Paul unpacks this in a beautiful way today. Verse 2, he says, Through Jesus, the spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. All right. Meaning, uh, through Jesus, all right, uh, Jesus and boy, I'm kind of stumbling over my words. Through Jesus and his spirit, we have been set free from our sin problem. Let that sink in, friends. Let that sink in. Verses three through four, he goes on to just summarize how this is not our work, but this is God's work and God's work alone. I think in a beautiful way, verses three and four summarize all of or most of where we were in last week's chapter, uh, chapter seven. Let's just read those two verses again. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin he what he condemned we're no longer condemned those who have faith but God condemned sin in the flesh in order uh, here's here's the answer to the why why would God do this in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit All right. God did it. There was nothing we could do to rescue ourselves. We saw that last week in 724. Now, friends, why would God do this? Let's think about who God is and get to his heart, understand his heart and his mind. Well, we've already said, and Paul says it here, that here's God did it to fulfill the righteous requirement of the law. All right, that's pretty clear here. We also see Paul pointing us to life. God wanted 
God desired to give us life, to set us free from death. So verse 1, verse 6, um, and then on down in the last paragraph, Paul talks about this life, this newness of life that he was talking about back in Romans chapter 6, the beginning of Romans chapter 6, and, and then the new way at the beginning of Romans chapter 7. Uh, God wanted to give us life. He wanted to fulfill the law. He wanted to give us life. He wants us, Paul says in verse 6, to have peace with God, no longer to be at war with God, but to have shalom with him, to have friendship with him. God desires that. God desires, um, God desires that we would be able to, uh, wait, wait, how does Paul say it? For those in the flesh cannot please God. No, God desires that we please him. God desires that we be friends with him. God desires relationship. He desires to connect with us. And we see that in this last paragraph. What does God do through his spirit? He dwells in you. He dwells in you. Paul repeats that phrase three times, dwells in you. The Spirit of God dwells in you. I mean, what more can that say about God? God desires this relationship, this friendship, so much so that he would send his son to die on the cross, to, be, to, to condemn sin, to condemn death, and be raised again, uh, that's important here. Why? That he might dwell in us. All right, so why would God do this? Why would God do this good work in us to fulfill the righteous requirement of the law, to give us life, to give us peace and friendship with God, uh, to give us his righteousness, and that he might dwell with us, that we might have friendship with him, that we might live with him, live together with him. Uh, I don't know how to let that sink in, friends. That's what we learn about God. It's oftentimes also helpful to ask, okay, what do we learn about ourselves? In this case, what do we learn about believers? Well, we do learn, and we might touch on what do we learn about unbelievers for those of us who maybe haven't yet taken that step of faith to receive God's gift of mercy. Well, we're still in the flesh. But friends, if we have received his grace, if we have believed and trusted in Jesus Christ, that he not only died, but as Paul says, even more importantly, he was raised. What does that word mean? It means to be resurrected, to, to wake up. Um, he was raised from the dead. Let's not let that just... Um, Let's not miss that. Let's not miss the miracle of that because that is our hope here. All right, but we can, what do we learn? Let me go back to that question. What do we learn about ourselves? What do we learn about believers in Jesus Christ? All right, friends, we are no longer in the flesh. We're no longer in the flesh, but we are in the spirit. All right, we belong to God. Paul makes that abundantly clear. He uses those words. You belong to God. Um, friends, this body, yes, it's dead because of sin. But you know what? The spirit is alive in us and our spirits are alive now Today, there is life, this newness of life in us. And then uh, there is this hope that he uh, points us to in verse 11. We have hope for these bodies, for the flesh, that these two, just like Jesus was raised from the dead, uh, will one day be raised from the dead to the glory of God the Father. You know what that tells us? God cares about these bodies. We should too. But friends, we are not 
in the flesh. Here's application for today. We are not in the flesh. We are in the spirit. Um, We need to know who we are. We need to know who we are. How do we do that? We first know and understand who God is. We can praise God by uh, by what we learn about him today. He is gracious. He is merciful. Uh, he is powerful to give us new life. But he has been merciful and gracious such that through Jesus there is no condemnation and there is newness of life so then we can know who we are know our identity friend you belong to jesus you belong to god i belong to god and my spirit is alive because of his spirit i am not in the flesh i am in the spirit and so what do we do friends how do we live today we are to think we are to set our minds we are to think and then live walk with him in the spirit think and live like we belong to god today